as you can see, that the, the, the title of the talk is very much trying to fit in with a mixed audience. It's about university language centres and their role, but I'll be talking about a specific project that is living on and with the rather catchy name urbanlanguages.eu, um, it really is open to everybody to join because it's something where, and I love the comment you made about global, Stefan, like it's a, a sort of a nicer word that really means foreign in so many eyes, eyes how we can actually make things work. Um, like a very sort of um, rather sad um, post-2000 lecturer in the UK, I've set out my sort of aims and objectives. By the end of this 45, 50, 60 minutes talk, you will gain a sense of the issues concerning multilingualism in the European and European context. You'll get to see key elements of the Lucide project. You'll be aware of the newsworthy of the languages in the press and even more patronising. You'll have some key facts and figures. Read the way language centres operate in the UK. Isn't that reassuring? Your life mapped out in four easy sections over the next hour. Um, a little bit, though, about me. Um, it, it is, I'm, I'm at an interesting point in my life that um, I'm, I'm, I've decided to take um, sort of early retirement next year. So now everything I do is, this is probably the last time I'm going to be saying this, and I'm trying to sort of develop a sort of eminence grise parallel character that I've not quite perfected actually. Well, it's not gone anywhere near. Um, to try and sort of recognise the fact that I've been in the business 25 years in higher education. Um, uh, and before that, um, I took a little bit of time off, two years in marketing. And then before that, I was a school teacher. Um, and I have had a sort of schizophrenic career that um, I, I did German and French at Oxford. I then did teacher training in German French with English as a foreign language at Goldsmiths in London. I then did a, a curious contemporary German studies um, postgraduate diploma at a, um, a, a, a polytechnic. It was very interesting going to someone completely different after Oxford. And then I did my master's in design studies at Central St. Martins, which is part of University of the Arts London. So I've always had this sort of mix of the importance of visual, the importance of design, languages, and in the end, my, for eight years before I started at LSE in 1999, um, I was building up a language centre for six art and design colleges, which became the University of the Arts London. So Central St. Martins, London College of Fashion, London College of Communication, Chelsea, Camberwell. And it really was a really big um, baptism of fire into languages for specific purposes, LSP. So it really was French for fashion, German for graphics, Italian for international design, for industrial design rather. And it, it was very, very interesting because when I took over the post at LSE, it seemed A, so easy because I was dealing with one university campus rather than campuses across the whole of London. Um, but also I'd got the technique of LSP and the importance of looking at the great mix of X percent core specific language, Y percent general, Z percent, I can't remember what that was, but there was a Z percent as well. And what has led me throughout is wherever I've worked, it's been within the urban context. And over the last 25 years, I have seen the process of internationalization in two really quite important and financially viable institutions, the LSE, um, which stands very really much shoulder to shoulder with Columbia in terms of status, academic prowess, um, outreach, and the University of the Arts London, that within the context of art and design, particularly one of the top colleges, Central St. Martins, really defines what there is in art education and, and how that has gone global. And what has been interesting is seeing how language centres, sometimes running parallel to a language faculty or department, sometimes part of, have during the 90s and noughties and now played a mixed role in internationalisation, sometimes being completely sidelined, you know, it's languages, nothing to do with internationalisation, you know, ho oh, oh. ho, uh, multinational, oh, nothing to do with multilingual or sometimes playing a very, very key role. And you notice that actually in, um, in, in the Europe that for the UK exists 
across the waters because, as we know, we have an election next week, May the 7th, and who knows whether the UK will be part of Europe? Who knows whether the UK will be the UK? Who knows? Dot, 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 dot. And with every day, the pound is losing value, um, and apparently that's due to the election. So we're in a very, very strange time. And the thing that I feel particularly important is language centres, whether they're independent, whether they're attached to a faculty, whether they're part of a faculty, whether it's a hybrid identity, play a key role in this process of globalisation and internationalisation. LSE is very specific. All of you have known the name. Most of you know some of the specifics. One, it's small, 10,000 students. It's a small campus. Um, out of those 10,000 students, 6,000 are postgraduate. Out of those 6,000 postgraduate students, 70% plus are non-UK. So it's a huge international mix. Undergraduate is, of course, only 4,000. And out of that, it flips. 30% are non-UK. And what may be of interest, that LSE is not a private university, it's a state university. There is only actually one private university in the UK, the University of Buckingham, that was founded in the 1960s. So Oxford, Cambridge, LSE, all those, the survival leave equivalent, they are state universities. We charge money, peanuts in many ways, I think in terms of some of the fees. But the fact is that, that we belong to a state system. And if you do that, it's very, very interesting how you interplay with the funds that are available and the status that's there. At LSE, words like multinational, international are banded around. And I said a couple of years ago, wouldn't it be a good idea to actually have some of our website in a different language? Now, if you go to the front page of the LSE website, Language Centre is there on the front page. I fought that battle year one after my arrival, it's there. And what was quite interesting was, no, why not? We're a British university. Things are taught in English. People have to speak English, so why do they need anything in another language? And I was quite taken aback by a really sort of old school, no. And I was also taken aback with colleagues who are non-UK, a mixture, sort of siding up with that, saying, well, you know, it, it, it's not necessary. And I said, but we talk about multinational and multi and international, and nobody mentions multilingual. And I remember this guy saying, but we're not. We're not multilingual. I said, but the, the amount of languages you hear on campus every day, remember the majority, by the way, of the academic staff are non-UK. 80% is non-UK. Um, and they went, yes, but that just goes on in the senior common room or in the dining room or in the school canteen and the university students. That doesn't count. And I love the idea of that doesn't count. And languages for a selection of academics, whether they're UK or non-UK, is what happens in my centre. People do a language in my centre. It doesn't happen. And I thought it was very, very interesting that here we are at the hub at the LS of E and very much Little England mentality is happening across nations through lots of rather scratchy reasons. And what gets me is the scratchiness of it. You can get people's backs up by this. And I'm thinking if you can get liberal academics backs up by the scratchiness, you know, now I can understand a bit better what happens in, in the outside world of identity shifting. But universities are moving towards having very active language policies. If you can see on the screen, we had um, there's lots of reviews that are taking place. It's like, what do academics do when they retire? Well, they write reviews, they get brought back in. And Wharton, Michael Wharton, was actually wonderful. He's from University College London. And he wrote a review on the importance of universities to cities, to the environment, wherever they're based, in terms of languages and internationalisation doing it. And indeed, University College London was the first university that said, OK, we're going back in time. If you want to come to University College London, you have to have a basic qualification in a foreign language, in a modern language, sorry. And then they said, but don't worry if you haven't, because obviously, remember, languages are not compulsory in schools. 
after 14 in UK. State schools, not compulsory after 14. Please remember that is the context. And if you are a university that is striving for outreach and proper social mix, you want at least, at least 70% from state schools. So immediately you'll be accused of loading the dice against it. But they said, don't worry, if you haven't got it, all you have to do is sign up for a language course that you have to do for two years, and you have to get the equivalent of a basic school certificate. But don't worry if you don't make it, because, uh, but just sign up for it. So it was very much a mix of, of sending out a message saying that languages are important. But the problem was that no other language, no other institution followed that. Even at LSE, we developed um, a language policy, and we're revising it this year, but it was very motherhood and apple pie. Like, um, don't worry if you haven't got a language, we'll give you a free language course. Um, it's not a problem, but we really encourage you to do it. And about 100 students go for this route. And they are all British students who've been to state schools that haven't been doing it. So it, it is a moderate success. But LSE, the way it treats languages, and this is the last bit of background I'm going to give, the, the numbers are quite good. There are 400 students taking either a degree, a degree option in either language and society, French, German, Russian and Spanish, or in literature and society. And these aren't Mickey Mouse, it's 25% of your degree. So they really are high level, they're pushing. If you do um, um, intensive beginners, Mandarin, it's six hours a week. Um, the next level up, we do five levels, drops an hour. There are about 2,000 students doing languages and extra. And then we also have about 2,000 students registered for English for academic purposes. We've got applied research projects, income generation, anything that can make money for the institution, anything we could put executive before or for business will do, and also outreach programs to schools. So we're all singing, all dancing. And in fact, we actually reach about 40% of the university population. But in a sense, we'd like even more. But as you can see, the British Academy decided, in a very British way, that they'd have to do some very important papers. And so they came up, and you can... The idea, by the way, there are far more slides on my presentation than are humanly possible to do in one session. And the idea is you do go home, get access to the slides, nice glass of wine, or whatever you prefer, and you enjoy clicking and relaxing in the privacy and comfort of your own home. So the British Academy, in a very British way, they started off with saying, I know, we'll call it Language Matters. You can imagine it a very clipped way. Two years later, they thought, hmm, it's not quite working. Let's do another paper, and we'll call it Language Matters More and More, which is a little bit desperate, I feel. <laughs> uh, not even just Language Matters More. More and more it matters. And then finally, they realised they couldn't do for their third final one of Language Matters even more than the other times where it mattered an awful lot and matters most. They actually called it Born Global, um, which sounded a little bit evangelical, but um, I'm part of that project. And um, my research is results are coming out in June. And what we're doing, we're, we're doing a re-re-review of why people learn languages at university level and students. But we're also finding those people that have said no to a language. Um, because nobody's asked them. And so we've got 100 people who said no that were very nervous. Could we track them down? You know, Friends, actually, we, the, how we got them... Because we said, um, we didn't really choose not to do a language, please contact me. And they thought it was like some sort of punishment. And then we had to go through the friends, uh, their, their friends, like people who registered for a language programme, and say, do you have got any friends that didn't do it? And you can give me their email or something like that. And so we tracked them down. But we really want to find out, like, why do you not want to do it? What is it? When everybody says it's useful, there, it's not easy. We've got five, though. It's free. Many courses do it. So it's going to be interesting. And um, universities are going to try and come up with a common policy. That's the idea within the UK. Um, and then obviously have variants on it. Now, as I say, I think the two years in marketing, to be honest, I was with a, I was with a company called How 80s Is This, Style Incorporated. And when I left that... I worked for the British Fashion Council, but it was actually used about languages in the fashion industry. Um, and I think that I've developed this 
annoyingly superficial approach to what I do. Um, and I think now by the time I'm fading out next year, so I, I've ceased to Apollo. I've, I've learned to live with it. And you just remember that I am, I am a director of a language centre which is hybrid, and my job is to bring good academics in. I would not dream of, of um, putting myself in that thing. And it's great when I look through my cast list and I see the number of people with PhDs, I see the people moving up, and I, I know in many ways um, that it's time for me to go because I think it's, it's in a world where having the right qualifications, the right mix is key. But what I, I am passionate about is the role that language centres have at universities, what they have to, the, to society, but also the management of it, how you get it right, and, and making sure that we're something, that we're an organisation that people will want to work in. I remember when I first started at LSE, a student quite innocently and naively said, how do you become a language centre director? And I have to stifle the laugh that you hang around in the right place at the right time and you do it. But in fact, the professionalisation of what we do in language sense, we should be more organised of what we need to do, how we need to do it, and, and what the stages are. And realise that we do occupy a very fertile territory between pure, in inverted commas, academia, and then service, which is um, a, a word fraught with, uh, with mixed values. One of the things that I came up with, again with this sort of slightly marketing mind, was I found many ways, I was going to so many things, I did a project for the British Council, and um, the number of times we were using multilingualism and plurilingualism, and I found there was a certain static quality to it. And um, as I say, you know, this really concept of flexilingualism is very much a sort of a marketing ploy that might seem incredibly superficial, if not now already in a few years' time. But one thing that did strike me, that in 2008 onwards, we saw the biggest migration of South Europe going to North Europe when we'd seen in the 1970s. And it just meant that people were moving out of necessity, out of economic necessity. And language wasn't a sort of little choice. Shall I learn a little bit to, you know, enjoy my little summer home in Tuscany? Or, um, indeed, this could be useful for business. Things where people were having to learn language. And they were having to learn languages that they didn't want to particularly learn. Or languages that, that were going to offer challenges. The number of British businessmen that we've signed up in our Mandarin courses is incredible. And they're doing it, not because they particularly want to learn Mandarin, but that's where the business is going and they feel they should do it. And I actually thought it was quite interesting because what people had to do, you had to be flexible about what jobs you did, how you did, what you were going to get paid, where you are going to live, where you are going to live in specific countries, but also the flexibleness had to come into your language acquisition as well. And I did in a sort of Wikipedia-type way try and come up, because I was asked to do um, a definition, and I said flexilingualism is a pragmatic approach to learning languages. It implies a realistic attitude whereby language choices and levels are defined by need, situation and context. It is a flexible and fluid process which responds to specific yet changing needs of an increasingly mobile workforce in a globalised economy. And I think that when you look at this, the way that language centres work within the urban context, within our cities, and as Stefan and people we all know, we work in cities, we work near cities, we come from cities, we know that they change. And that cities to be truly successful, I think have to have flexible identities. And I think as well, if you are a speaker of more than one language, we know how your identity can be flexible. We know if we're learning a language and us that work in the business of either teaching or providing languages, we enjoy the game of being flexible. You know, I'm in Germany, I'm speaking German. What is my new self? There's a project that um, I haven't included in the presentation, but it's called the Fiesole Group, Fiesole, the town near Florence. And what we're looking at, and we're very much hoping that Columbia and Yale will be involved in this, we're looking at the flexible, shifting identities of the global academic. That academic that may be starting in Spain, 
um, for their undergraduate degree, that goes to a postgraduate degree in another country, that does a PhD in another country, postdoc in another country, and then will end up teaching in yet another country, but probably teaching everything in English. So who are you from a pedagogic point of view? What's my teaching style? Who am I? All of this. And languages play a big role. Obviously, English for academic purposes, teaching English for academic purposes, how you teach, what style you do it, but also what is the language you need to learn. If you are originally Spanish, go through that, end up in Germany, what sort of German do you need? And I think there's fascinating work to be done. But one of the things I'm thinking about is how you get language noticed. And one of the ways is doing a symposium like this. Other ways are actually hitching yourself to the movement in time. But often it's the case that the press which should be a very, very, very big... Um, I should make this bigger. And how do I... Is that plus just up there? I'm having a Mac moment. That one there? No. Nope. Nope. That one right there. That one there, the green. Oh, that one. The green? Mm -hmm. Oh, colour-coded. Ah. Mac. Mac. Oh, PC. <laughs> anyway, The Guardian is, if you know the British press, is the sort of newspaper of... Academics. It's what you have. The Times Higher Education Supplement and The Guardian. It's got a big readership uh, amongst the conoscenti, intelligentsia, and, of course, it's what you want to think. So the, the British Guardian um, has actually got um, a page, and they do languages every week. They were paid a small sum of money by the British Academy, basically bribed, and they will feature an article about languages all the time. And what they've done, they haven't normally done the trick, because when you get a languages in the paper in the UK, it's crisis, nobody's learning languages, nobody can speak a language, nobody wants to learn a language, crisis, crisis. They don't balance it out by saying, yes, the number of people who are doing a full degree in languages has dropped, but the number is actually going up. But they don't mention there are 100,000 students learning languages as an extra or part of the degree, because that would be good news. And those numbers have gone up, basically 10,000 a year over the last 10 years. But what we've got is a national paper actually choosing, and in fact, um, we're not going to do it, but Latinos learning Spanish in the US, I really want to discover my heritage and reclaim it video. The case for language learning, how Manx language came back from the dead. That's from the an Isle of Man, which has about 20 people on it and a lot of sheep. Um, there's also the case for language learning, nine ways to use language learning, the case for language learning. It basically, if you look through, you can see a great resource. And it's all available on web. And basically, most of the stuff finds its way into hard press. But what I found, it was a real, basically, watershed moment for me, is that we actually had a key newspaper... OK, not the national press, uh, popular press. It would be nice if the Sun did that. But it's something you can say, right, we've got something uh, that's important now. Command, tab, and it should disappear. Oh, that's come. Why has that come? Can I press red? Is there a red thing there? Is that, is that? There we go. That's lovely. Um, and also, the infographics continue. The, econ the Economist does a regular feature on languages. Now, that's completely unusual. You're thinking, if you're doing it from trend spotting, I mean, one of the things I say going back when was style and corporate, it was about fashion forecasting, trend, looking at the street. But I think that's something that we need to do, and we do do in languages. We're actually sort of looking at things. Languages are heard but not seen. Um, that's half the problem, the invisibility of it. And this is a rather interesting little website um, that does make me laugh. It's the London Sound Survey. What does London really sound like? And I was really excited because I thought it'll have great, you know, snapshots of the languages spoken in London. And I was rather disappointed when you click on various clusters. What you get is um, um, some sort of key sort of detail. But the actual sort of language that you get is sometimes not actually 
um, uh, not as, as sort of detailed. And it's sort of say, you look at it, it says, sound of a car, children speaking in the distance. And you think, this is such an amazing opportunity to turn a sound map in London to be a language map. So we're going to work with people to see if we can get that done in um, uh, a way that we can use it more. Um, also, um, ways that London is being portrayed. This is a great one. It's done by University College London. And I think it ties up with somebody in the audience that may well be doing that. Um, and that's the Twitter feed of London at Night, all the different languages that are spoken. And I think it's this sort of imagination that we're getting more and more key. Infographics are getting more and more important. There's the colour-coded map of the languages that are spoken in London. And then this is just this pure sort of little amusing... This is a, a map of a very literal translation of the streets in London done in French. But the point is... It's the fact of trying to mix high level with low level, with a populist approach to making people aware of languages and how it fits into your urban community. Um, I thought what was very interesting was if you go to a number of these projects, and I say, um, I'm going to rush through this a little bit, you have time, you get amazing projects working with schools and sometimes led by school students themselves about trying to map London, how it fits into your community, how it's as, and this is new. This is people seizing on the fusion of art and design, and I think that in many ways every language centre project to do with something like this or language project should have a tame art student or graphic design student with them to really say how can I get that across? What and also um, high tech media, but. One of the things I do want to um, look at, and I've, got, I've, I've brought some leaflets and, uh, and, and books, is this, if you like, was the sort of the grandfather of our big project, LETPP, Languages in Europe, Theory, Policy and Practice. Because what we had, we had a one-year funded project, and what it was, we had to, at the LSE, and we're a social science institution, so we should know what we're doing, um, we had a chance to work with people outside of the language centre, so sociologists, people in political theory in the Department of, faculty, sorry, Department of Government, um, to try and say, look, how can we get people together? And we really didn't want to have the normal thing where you book in a conference, 90% are the linguists, you're preaching to the converted. We wanted to see the enemy in front of us. We tried to find people who had blocked language policy, they were against languages, you know, business people who said we don't need languages. And it's hard to get them because they don't want to turn up. They say, what are you going to do? Shout at me for 40 minutes? And, but it was very interesting seeing the transformation effect that we had when we put people together. And what we did, we and I'll whiz through this, one of the projects of the language was about a survey of over a thousand people. Again, they were mainly sort of very user friendly. But we, we asked a question about languages and identity, and I say I won't plough through each one, but you can see that the range of opinions, even with language people, actually questioned some of the perceptions of how useful languages were, um, um, the problem of immigration, the role of heritage languages or community languages or, or, or. Um, and, uh, you know, looking into the fact, for example, should every major city have a language policy? Only one does in the UK, and it's the city of Sheffield. In fact, what we noticed, that the middle-sized city was always actually better at getting things organised. They sort of had a sort of, I don't know, uh, a value. They wanted to sort things out. When you get to the megacity, like London... The, oh, it's just, oh, well, well, everybody speaks another language. There's 365, one for every day. You don't need a policy on that. You happen, you do. It'll sort itself out. Let the market decide. You get all of that going on. And it's very, very difficult. And we almost were coming to a, a very superficial conclusion. Big city, bad. Medium-sized city, good. Small city, sometimes even better or whatever. A small city could go very wrong in a small city. But... Um, 
you know, we looked at ranges like this, English is a global language of business diplomacy, is this a good thing? And then key things, the various aspects of multilingualism. And you can see sometimes that the, the spread of opinion was quite sort of mixed. Um, dominance of English, good thing, well, I leave you with these um, sort of final things written through. And this was, I think, the interesting one. In the current economic climate, has the EU dream of multilingual forces run out of steam? A very spread, and I think it's interesting the vision is evolving. Do remember that the EU goal is two plus one, that everybody should speak their own language plus another one at near fluency plus another one at sort of B1. Um, it's shifted that the other language it's assumed is going to be English, and that's a big step for the European Union. And then the other one could be, well, well anything, you know. Um, it doesn't have to be um, a European Union based out of history language. They're actually saying that can be Arabic, that can be Mandarin, that can be Cantonese, that could be. So that's a big mindset for the European Commission to say French plus English plus Arabic. And that is a hot mix. And that's what's in it. I actually was giving um, um, a session at the European Commission on Tuesday of this week. And there's some interesting developments, so if I get time, I'll, I'll mention, about how things are being pushed forward and how they don't want it to be lost, but there's a greater sense of mediated practicality coming through. The Lucide Project dreadful name for a project languages in urban communities integration and diversity for Europe way flag waving you know um, but the website is urbanlanguages.eu and the continuation project is going to be called urbanlanguages.eu but what we did it's so small this writing Steve I'm like sort of Mouse like, um, I forgot what my project is. Education, language learning, and language support, the public sphere, economic life, the private sphere, the urban space. I've only got one contact lens in, which made sense in this morning, but doesn't make any sense now. You're all blurred, it's blurred, everything. Probably best. Um, we've got these five divisions, and what we tried to find out in this project was it wasn't a language project per se. It was the role of languages in urban life. And we were talking about the negative thing, which we started in LETP. How much does it cost to get all these interpreted translations? OK, you read it in the Daily Mail, in the popular press, all this money spent on translation for Bengali, Turkish. But does it, in fact, save money? Because the cost of not doing it could end up quite catastrophic. Um, how much money does a multilingual city bring to a city? Uh, bring to the city. I mean, you had Birmingham in the UK. Did a whole campaign of the multilingual city. You can put your multilingual company, your, your workforce here. We have a workforce that speaks a range of language. The power of India, we all know in the business of languages, you've got the hot languages, the not so hot language. Oh, it's so chic, my son and daughter speak French and German. Hmm, and my son and daughter speak Punjabi and Urdu. Oh, mm, mm, mm. um, it's it's, you know, we, we, we will tell that. All of a sudden now, with the rise of India, oh, this could be interesting, moving across. Mandarin, hottest language, you know. We also get, like, people from Cantonese saying, I've got to learn Mandarin, you know, convert me. Um, and I think that we know, we try to look at the marketing power of languages. So, Lucid, um, here's the project. Um, we've got some hardcore stuff the city reports, and the city reports um, are reports, surprisingly, about a range of cities. I was going to say A to Z, but it's not bad. We've got A to V, from Athens down to Varna. Um, our, you know in a European project, you can have non, two non-European partners, and we ended up, there were, there were political reasons, Ottawa, um, and we've got other Canadian cities. I think when you have one Canadian city, you get four for the price of one. So as you can see from the list. Um, Sydney, we, um, uh, Australia, we just got Melbourne. But we had Joe Lobianco, who's quite um, um, a, a power personality, if you're in the world of languages. But it was quite interesting in getting that range. And you look at that range of city. What we wanted to do in the city reports were facts and figures, but we wanted to have a narrative. 
We wanted to find some stories behind. And boy, do you get some stories. And sometimes the stories are in the facts and figures as well. If you look at London, what do you get from London? You might look at spend a minute in it. You get, of course, the big city, the politics, the plus and minus. I've written a thing about um, the role of languages in financial uh, district. Um, but then if you contrast that with Osijek in Croatia, you realise speaking the wrong language could cost you your life in the 90s. And you're dealing with this sort of power um, of large mega cities, minor cities. You look at Madrid and you have an energy there. The way that the community is responding to the different faiths and the stories that are in it. You look at Dublin and you realise Ireland, the country of emigration, suddenly became a country of immigration and how that all changed and what they were and the effect it had on their identities and flexi identities as well of you know the Irish and there's lots of documented evidence of the visual effect of what it means to be Irish to sound Irish so I'm half Irish myself and I just want but if you look through all of these again um, Limassol in Cyprus that's obviously Greek Cyprus, Greek Cyprus, but there's a whole hinterland of unspokenness and the role of Turkish. They are very good reads, very good reads indeed. Um, we've also, I do hate this word toolkit, but we've done it because remember for a European project to get you money, it can't be all theory now. You've got to think the thoughts and you've also got to tool the kits. I don't know if that works. But anyway, you've got to produce things. And what we've produced are toolkits. And the idea is, as you can see, that we've divided up more or less along the lines of the theories. But we've done toolkits to actually help people in certain worlds. So if you look at this multilingual in health and community, you actually get um, 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 uh, obviously an introduction. But what we've tried to do is try to look at um, questions, indications that management should ask. So if you are working in the healthcare sector, what you should do as a manager, how you can, what advantages there are to maximising the potential. And in fact, running throughout the Louis Lucy project is this idea of maximising the language capital. Languages have a worth. If you exploit this word, if you exploit the language capital, you're making money for the community, for your country. Sometimes it's real money. Sometimes it's just a feeling of worth. Worth is, is as good as money sometimes. And that's what the whole point is. So if you look through these projects, you get ideas, you get examples. So um, you get connections. Um, um, uh, we also came up with, particularly the health sector, this question of translation. One very good example in London, in one of the boroughs, was they decided they would have everything recorded because they found that not only did the written translation cost a lot, sometimes people couldn't read it. And also it was in the wrong dialect or they'd shifted it. So what they do, they've now done all audio responses. So they've got people in the community. So you, in rather than saying, can I have an info sheet, you ring things up, you actually questions. So you've actually got a whole range of ways. So if you look at the toolkits, you can actually sort of um, uh, get to quite a, um, a, a different sort of way of looking at things. Just to go out of this, to go back into it, will make sense. But when I mentioned that we, we worked through a project and we wanted to make it sure that it wasn't um, completely dry. So if you look at the toolkits, that's a definite um, thing to hold. If you look at the, the, um, the profiles, the books about this, we're also producing a book of the books. But what we did, we um, worked with two artists who... Um, decided that they wanted to take on um, an idea. So they weren't linguists. They, you know, they'd done a bit of language, but they just liked the whole concept of... Because they, when we were talking to them, they said, I can't understand what you want. Because if one of the things about Lucide is 
the appearance of a city, what more can you do than street signs or you have a few things written at a market? All those cliches that are great and are valid, but is there anything more that you can do? And what they did, they set themselves a question of how can you turn the ordinary into something worthwhile? So they did this walk across London. So they started off in the west of London. And um, it's, it's, oh, let's see now, did it work? Yes, here we are. I got off the train and wandered out to the main road. I wanted to create a new map. It was sunny and busy and messy. I walked over the bridge and down to the main road. The air was thick and sweet with Indian food and car fumes. South Hall ebbed and flowed with urgency. Language has swallowed up this part of town and made it into something new. And they just, they took the graphics, but they turned it in, as graphic designers do, is to something that looks and feels rather thing. I wanted it to be slow. I wanted to absorb as much as I could. The high street is an in-between place. Non-residential, not industrial, but commercial. It shifts and changes at a rate unlike many other urban territories. It responds and quickly mirrors the users and users' use of its hinterland. It's public, yet somehow anonymous. And despite our familiarity with it, we rarely stop to observe and read it. And what I felt really proud of just having this, in a sense, um, slightly more than a bon bouche, but the idea that we were getting our sort of Brechtian Verfremdungs effect, éloignement, alienation effect, of looking at things we take for normal. Because we are in this sort of push-me-pull of, on the one hand, it is the new normal. Multiculturalism, multiple identities, flexible identities is the new normal. But sometimes it's quite good to get that frisson of of it. Not in a sort of post-post-colonial exotic, oh isn't this interesting, but also seeing that we sometimes don't appreciate what it is for these differences. Um, the, the person goes right through to the centre of London and it's quite interesting the different languages that come up. And if we just go to the end of the journey, um, which is right at the, um, the east of east, and he goes through um, Celebrate the mess, which I thought was rather nice. Conflict contrast varied layers of the city. Roads and carving up an unfriendly for pedestrians. A provocation for others to revisit where they live with fresh light. Look harder, look again. Dead, lacking in people, few signifiers of language. My feet heard, cross the river on the Woolwich Ferry, dance across the Thames, up the hill and down the high street, the noise of shopping, to the Docklands Light Railway. Fan. And I thought that really was a nice sort of end and I think that it's something that we could all do. I would love to see audio maps and cities like that, but working with poets, working with literature people, working with designers, taking it to another level. And I was really pleased that at LSE we have got LSE cities, which are urban geographers, urban economists. And one of them, Suzanne Hall, um, and the links to her projects are there, um, did an amazing thing where she took a street in quite a poor area of London, Peckham, and just linguistically tracked it. But what she did, she just didn't linguistically track it, she then economically powered it up. And what was really interesting, we've all got in any major city, or minor city, you know those shops where you think, how do they survive? Do they actually sell anything? It's got like groceries, food, tap, tap, that, who goes in there? And she, she went into one of the shops and she found an economic powerhouse that almost matched Harrods or Macy's. You go into these shops and yes, it's piles of washing powder in there. They're all owned by different people. They're owned by different communities speaking different languages. And the thing that she thought was fascinating was there was an African area shop and the people were speaking Yoruba or Hausa, I can't remember, Nigeria. But that was like the first job these women have. It's, it's for nails there. And then there was a phone area um, that was Bengali. And they were doing so much money from this phone area. They, they were charging a higher rent, because the rent could vary depending on the shop, than actually in the West End of London. There's an equivalent to Manhattan. And she said all that was going on with languages, code switching, code switching going on all the time. And she said, and you actually see, the linguistic ability of those people actually far excess the academic body of LSE. Um, I'm whizzing through this because, A, you can look at these things at your own pace. Um, but this is a little thing that I did with financial companies. And um, 
I'll get to sort of really um, to the final slide, because basically what was interesting, I said to top financial employers, I mean, I can't mention their names, but if I said HSBC, Barclays, PricewaterhouseCooper, um, <laughs> JP Morgan, anyway, Deloitte, you'll get a feel, you know, they were probably companies very similar to those. And what was really interesting is you go to their HR, sometimes to CEOs, um, because I'm also a um, UK director of the Confucius Institute, so yeah, I've had quite a few doors open. And they all, oh, it's, they're so important. Language is so important. To have a multi, multilingual workforce, it's very, very important. Do you pay any extra money? No. Do you actually keep a record of the language skills in your HR? No. Um, do you insist on it for recruitment? No. No, 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 no. And the worry was, if your HSBCs don't do it, what can we do for small and medium enterprises that we're hoping to be more sort of language? And we're just thinking, we're in this major city. But they did come up with good things. Yes, it was a good thing. Yes, they would take it into account. There were some really good areas of good practice. Um, some, and I will actually name them HSBC, have a language for all policy, from the receptionist to the CEO. But it's only in one language. Guess what? It's Mandarin. Um, there is a very sort of, there is a danger that this is an Anglo-lingualism coming up where it's all about making sure your English language skills and then there's something else, is a little bit of window dressing or it's to do with targeting new markets. Um, and that's something that there, but they do say, everybody said, it should be a fixed part of secondary education. Um, if you look at the role of language centres specifically. Um, I used to do a survey, it really was like one man and a phone, um, trying to find out the languages were up with language centres and also I was fighting against the government. Eight years ago the government had no idea how many people were studying a language at university outside of the degree. It was completely new and the press didn't. And I said, this is crazy, we, we have to do it. So the Association of University Language Centres, we did an annual survey of saying, how many people are doing language, which one, and whatever. I don't do it anymore, but uh, my colleagues in AULC do. And what we do, we try and actually gauge the demand, and what these is what the survey does. Because if the government doesn't know what's happening, how can the government in, in, in invest in the language capital of students? If they don't know that the story isn't actually all that bad, well, there. So the numbers we've got, there should be about 100 universities plus. So we reckon you can expand those numbers. But those are the numbers, and you can see they're going every year. And you can actually see that um, the numbers are decreasing. It's all very healthy. You look at the languages. It's surprising that Mandarin as an expansion is only happening... Um, in selected universities, the Spanish, French, German um, mix is still very strong. There's some growth areas coming up, though, the way that Chinese is going to um, expand. Again, German's coming up. There's a bit of worry about Italian. But these are the interesting um, things. 60% of these students are actually doing it for credit. And the credit can vary to 25% of a university degree or it can just be for 10% or 15% of it. But the point is, this is all good news. And if you are doing it as part of a degree, it's free. And if you are doing it as an extra, the amount you pay is relatively small. And we now charge round about $14,000 a year. And what some universities are doing Language is becoming a marketing device. If you come to our university, you get a free language course. Um, and then building up. And so you're actually getting languages as being part of a profile. And it's quite interesting that that is spread amongst the big urban universities and also rural campus universities. The, the rural campus unit are saying, we're international, really. You might be in the middle of nowhere, but hey, you can learn a language and we're connected up with something. Or a big urban university, it's a sophisticated, it's part of our image. It's part of the idea, the identity of graduateness. So if you look at these, it really, really is good news. And the withdrawal rates 
are absolutely very, very small. Um, um, it, it, again, you can actually sort of dig into these, and it would be very, very good to actually see if you could get the similar figures from the States to find out how that's happening, because mapping use, mapping uptake, is very, very important. When I deal with the government, um, I'm part of... Um, once a year, I meet up with government representatives, and it's quite interesting, as the years go by, the level of people that government send to these committee meetings has got low. But now we're going up again, because actually, we wrote to the political parties saying, our language is going to be in your manifesto, and if not, why not? And we've managed to get into all these things. We know it is part of a hot topic there. Um, but basically, all of this stuff, and I'm just going to the end of this, um, you would get a lot of information about how things fit in. And then, I really am going to zoom up, we actually did a more concentrated language survey with these universities. And if you wanted to dig down what a range of universities, from sort of Ivy League to post-1992 universities, you actually have got a good feel there. And what we've done, we've really gone into why people are doing language, what the motivation is, and, um, and really just sort of um, looking into the whys and wherefore. So this is what I'm going to finish. Um, if you summarise our roles and the challenges, we're all in cities. We all, as part of our remit have to work with our communities. Our immediate community, of course, our university, our students, our staff. Then we have the world outside that is getting nearer and nearer. As universities buy up roads and streets, that we basically swallow up communities. I know it's happening at LSE. Our business community is, is around us and near us. But that's a way we can actually help by fitting into the fabric of our cities and actually realising that, yeah, for the businessman who's paid $300 for a small intensive language course, that's what they've come from, they're paid. But we know that the summer schools we do for school students, we have a thing called Roots into Languages, where we try and convince students, don't give it up at 14, um, carry on till 16. I mean, it's as basic as that. Um, do carry on at 16 and try and get for 18 because we want to see the linguists of the future. We also have you know, all the good signs about um, identity. Um, I remember when one of our outreach programmes, um, an um, Albanian student said, uh, I said, what language are you studying? And he went, Spanish. I said, that's great. And what other language do you speak? And how often have we heard this? Oh, they don't count. I love that phrase, they don't count. And I did this thing slightly over-echoing, you know, Albania, great future, great coastline, blah, 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 whoa, golden. But, you know, and with your language, you could help. But it was just so frustrating seeing it. But as you can say, that universities are vital to the economy of any size city. Language centres do contribute. Universities encourage integration and celebrate diversity. Again, a role for language centres. Recognising language capital of existing speakers of other languages. Maximising potential of home students learning other languages and other members of the community. Increasing visibility, welcoming international students, shifting image, international identity, it's part of our DNA. Addressing wider audience, thinking outside the immediate environment. And getting management buy-in to the principle of language provision and resources. And that's what language centres can do. If you Google Vulco, another, another city in the middle of nowhere, W-U-L-K-O-W, Vulco, the Vulco Group, that's um, a section of 40 European um, language centres directors who've put together a memorandum in a book of language centre practice. And I think that, I'll leave you the final, that is the vision of the future, um, that is the new centre buildings of LSE, and on the second and third floor was where our new language centre was meant to be until they decided they should give the whole building over to the departments of finance, accounting and management. So money talks louder than languages in our case, but we've got some very nice new alternative accommodation planned. But what I hope you've got from this talk is those four things. Do you get a better idea of the context of language centres within the UK, a bit about the European feel and the interplay, but also how we are so important 
about the community. And I look forward to the rest of this afternoon to really hearing here from you as individuals who are doing specific research in that. Because to be in New York, to be at Columbia, to be in the world of language provision is a very, very exciting time. And I've got a feeling our program is probably the worst time in the world to even think of retiring. But I think that what we are doing, we've always delivered, we are delivering, we work collaboratively, we enjoy working with other faculties and departments, we can provide extra fill-in and energy in extra dimension, and that's why I'm in the business. So thank you very much, anyway, for listening to the first thing.